It is a great pleasure to be able to be a moderator of this very important video conference, not only for Paraguay because of what Dr. Ratanal represents, but also because of all the other universities that are connected from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay. And so I would like to welcome you all. And I would also like to highlight the way we are going to be carrying out the questions during this conference. The questions, please ask them throughout the, the presentations. There will be a team from ECA and from the Faculty of Agricultural Sciences who will be gathering those questions and then conveying them to Dr. Ratalan. And Dr. Le uh, Pro Professor Dr. Leisamon, coordinator of the soil area of the Faculty of Agricultural Sciences will be in charge of this. So to begin with this video conference, we are going to give the floor to Professor Dr. Suli Vera de Molinas, president of the National University of Asuncion. Doctor, go ahead, please. Good morning to all. May you all be welcome to this lecture jointly organized by the National University of Asuncion and the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, ICA. I would like to greet the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, Mr. Moises Bertoni, and Director, General Director of ICA, Manuel Otero, Director of ICA Paraguay, Dr. Gabriel Rodriguez, and also the Vice President of UNA, Professor Miguel Torres Mbai, authorities of national and international institutions that are joining us today, and all the other participants who may be researchers, professors, and students from different universities from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay, who are following this simultaneous broadcasting. Special greetings to our distinguished lecturer, Professor Dr. Ratan Lal, World Food Prize 2020. This event of major significance for this university is the result of a long-standing partnership between the National University of Asuncion and the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, ICA, through the outstanding work of Dr. Gabriel Rodriguez, whom I thank for his management and for giving us the opportunity to show the results of this collaborative work between two institutions, the UNA and ICA. To Professor Ratan Lal, highly recognized as a research professor and winner of the World Food Prize 2020 and also a goodwill ambassador of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. My thanks, Dr. Rathan Lal, for honoring us with your participation here. And I'm sure that with his contributions, his experiences, you'll be able to help us better understand the central topic of your conference, soil, climate change. And thus, we will be able to articulate it with the pursuit of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs 2030, at UNA, Paraguay, and regional level. Dr. Lal, as an expert, will make us ponder upon a topic of great interest in topicality. As everyone knows, Paraguay has natural resources, resources such as water, land, and sun. So we are able to produce food for our population. But in certain aspects, we are also producing food for the world, always based on food security. 
It is also appropriate to note that the theme of the conference is being worked locally around the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, specifically Goal 13, the Climate Action, which aims to take urgent action to combat climate change and its effects. And one of the goals is precisely related to universities, that is, to enhance education, awareness, and human and institutional capacity for climate change mitigation, adaptation, mitigation, and early warning. So, from as a public university in Paraguay, our university is committed to join efforts to strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate-related risks and natural disasters, as well as to collaborate to incorporate climate change-related actions in national policies, in our strategies and national plans as well, and also to promote mechanisms to increase our capacity for effective climate change planning and management in our academic units. And in this case, we are putting a particular emphasis on youth and the local and marginalized communities. We'd like to remind you that for us, it is very important to say that education is the present and future of all countries. And we wish to continue strengthening strategic partnerships between all networks, national and international networks, collaborating with the Ministry of Agriculture and other institutions in everything that has to do with research and university outreach. Now, I would like to reiterate my thanks to Professor Dr. Ratan Lal for his willingness and kindness in honoring us with us as with his time his knowledge in this long awaited conference through the alliance with ICA so i officially open this international you know conference and i wish you all an excellent scientific day thank you very much Thank you very much, Madam President. Before I give the floor to Director General of ICA, I would like to remind you that this video conference is being broadcasted through ICA News and Facebook. So, Dr. Manuel Otero, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Good morning, all. Dear Minister of Agriculture and Lives, Dr. Paraguay, Engineer Santiago Bertoni, dear Director, President of the prestigious University of Asuncion, Professor Dr. Sully Rivera de Molinas, dear Professor Ratan Lal, will, Goodwill Ambassador of ICA and the World Food Prize 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, ICA tries to adapt to times, developing a policy, an open door policy, and seeking, as the president said, a number of alliances with governments, with regional mechanisms, with the private sector, and particularly with the centers of excellence. Centers of excellence in this continent and member states of ICA worldwide, and we always try to make value the principle of ICA knows who knows. That is why it is so important to have this agreement with the National University of Fashion Soon. And I reiterate our commitment to work together to generate knowledge based on science, aiming at the transformation of the agri-food systems. 
we have an intelligent agriculture, intensive in terms of knowledge, and where access to the new frontier of knowledge requires some better and higher qualified resources, human resources, and therefore this is a key topic. We also give much importance to the agreement with you know, the Ohio State University and the Living Soils program that we launched together with Dr. Lal last December 2nd, 2020. This program, which has a clear leadership by Dr. Lal and ECA's full commitment, shows that it is precise to halt the degradation of the soils, a resource that is already affecting the productivity of our processes and our main production chains. Without living soils, without healthy soils, it would be topic to think of productivity levels that are absolutely necessary if we look into 2050. And it is key to strengthen and build a much more harmonious and synergic relationship with the environment. This is no longer a negotiable issue. I would like to quote Dr. Lal here. That is to say, we cannot have life without soil, and we don't have soil without life. Both are intrinsic and part of the same reality. So the objective is to produce more with less and have a sustainable management or handling of soil, and which will require the use of ancestral knowledge, ancestral knowledge with the newest technology. This year is a very important one because we have the UN summoning for the transformation of our food systems and then COP26. In both cases, Latin America, Mercosur, Paraguay, all agricultural producers, researchers must be duly represented. And the topic of soil's health should be a key component of all our discussions. To conclude, I would like also to thank the universities of Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, who have joined us in this broadcasting, which is of significant transcendence. And we are all looking forward to listening to the always clear and precise words by Dr. Professor Ratan Lal, who always enlighten our future. So again, count on us, Ica, count on ICA. Thank you very much, Director General. Before giving the floor to the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, Mr. Santiago Bartoni, we have received a note from the government of Paraguay through which the president, Mario Provenites, regrets not being able to be present during this video conference, but he appoints as representative of the president the engineer Santiago Bertoni, Minister of Agriculture and Livestock of Paraguay. So, Mr. the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I would like to greet with Professor Dr. Suli Vera de Molina, National Univers President of National University of Asunción, Director General of ICA, Dr. Manuel Otero, Mr. Gabriel Rodriguez, ICA's representative in Paraguay, Dr. Ratan Lal, a prestigious speaker, and all, all the other presidents and the public who are listening to this conference. I would like to congratulate the organizers for choosing such a current topic and which will help us think about around all the concepts by Dr. Rednet, who was the father of soil conservation back in the 30s, and with all the science that has been developed since. And uh, now society is 
concern about the sustainability of agricultural resources and the impact of farmers. And definitely we have a responsibility as farmers throughout the world, and particularly those in the region, to handle soils and preserve soils and all other resources in order to be able to produce food for the population and for export. And the countries in the region, and particularly Paraguay, has been doing so in an efficient way. I would like to pinpoint that toward the late 1990s, Paraguay incorporated within its productive systems in a massive way, a conservation agricultural systems like di direct uh, growth, uh, rotation of crops, and different amendments that are being applied in agriculture that had allowed for the different producing regions that have been used for the past 40 years have improved their conditions and their productivity. And so we have become a successful, successful country from the perspective of agricultural production. We are convinced that our production systems are absolutely sustainable. The systems in the region have been applying everything that has to do with soil sciences to keep soils alive, as Dr. Rattan will probably talk, uh, mentioned during his presentation and also everything that has to do with the preservation of water resources to preserve uh, forest. We have laws, 15-year-old uh, laws, that prohibit the cutting of native forests. So that has allowed producers not only to be successful producers, but also to be responsible for the conservation of a large part of the natural resources in our country. I hope this will be a very enriching morning for all of us. I would like to congratulate the organizers once again for picking this topic, such a relevant topic, and may this illustrate people in general the relevance of talking about conservation topics in agricultural preservation. May all you have a wonderful day, and thank you very much for your invitation to participate. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. So the most important moment of this video conference has arrived with the presentation by Rod Dr. Ratanlal. Dr. Ratanlal is a PhD, a university professor who's distinguished in everything that has to do with soil sciences. And he is the director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center of the Ohio State University. He's an adjunct professor of, of Iceland uh, University. He's uh, also an adjunct professor of uh, University Pontificia, Pontificia of Chile. He Graduated in 1963 from the Punjab Agricultural University in Punjab. He, in 1965, obtained a master's in science in the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. And then he obtained his PhD in 1968 in the Ohio State University. He has been a distinguished professor in different universities, like Sydney in Sydney, Australia, and Institute ITA. And he also he's been also a professor at the State University of Ohio. He is a member of the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for Advances of Science, the Soil and Water Conservation Society, the World Association of Soil and Water Conservation of India, and the UK. He has received a number of honors and awards uh, with uh, every, the uh, award Wurlak Lieri, the Sawitanan in India, Comland from Germany, and in 2017 as well, he also received the honor medal of Melendez Pelayo in Santander, Spain, and a distinguished professor of soil science in Rio, Brazil, as well as 29. 
4042 graduation award in Ohio State University, a distinguished historical award. He has obtained a number of honorary degrees, Doctor of Science honoris causa of the University of Punjab, Ludania, India, the University of uh, uh, Life Sciences, as in 2005, the Aluk Russo Balti State University of Moldova, 2010, the Technical University of Dresden, Germany, 2015, the University of Leda, Spain, 2017. He has also been part of uh, the um, member of a scientific center of CERT, uh, Department of Defense and the Global Soil Forum in Germany. He has been the directive member of the World Week of Soil, as a consultant of the European FASI. He is Hugo Flores in Dries Animal, Germany. He, the Convention of UN against the certification in Germany 2020-22. Professor Lau was one of the main authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, through which the Intergovernmental Panel awarded him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, as well as the Global Champion of Eric Lenz on desertification. He also was awarded the Weather Food Award in 2020. In Japan, and the World Food Prize in 2020, and also in Japan, in the U.S. Agricultural World Prize and designated award. He is a goodwill ambassador by the International Institute and uh, Agriculture, and he's in Cathedra of Soil Sciences. So, Dr. Lau, thank you. <clears throat> thank it's you. a great pleasure to introduce you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and see the screen. I'd like to begin by thanking yes, President uh, Professor Julie Vera, President of the National University. I'd like to thank Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Engineer Santago Bartoni, Dr. Manuel Otera, the Director General of uh, IICA. Uh, my colleague, friend, uh, Mr. Jorge Bardin, many other distinguished colleagues and friends. It's a great honor, great privilege to be a cooperator, partner, uh, working closely with ECA on the Living Soil Program, and to be a speaker this morning. Thank you for the invitation. I would like to begin with a quotation from Pope Francis. I borrowed language from his encyclic of 2015. I think he made certain statements which are very relevant. Here he says, when we speak of the environment, what we really mean is a relationship existing between nature and the society which lives in it. Nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves, or as a mere setting in which we live. We are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. He also said, ongoing research should also give us a better understanding of how different creatures relate to one another in making up the larger units, which today we term ecosystems. The protection of the environment is in fact an integral part of the development process and cannot be considered in isolation from it. I borrowed three other statements which I think are very relevant to carbon sequestration. Number one statement, 171, it is encyclic. The strategy of buying and selling carbon credits can lead to a new form of speculation which would not help reduce the emission of polluting gases worldwide. This statement is very relevant to payment for ecosystem services instead of market-driven carbon credit. In 190 paragraph, the Pope says, environmental protection cannot be assured solely 
on the basis of financial calculations of costs and benefit. The environment is one of those goods that cannot be adequately safeguarded or promoted by market forces. I really commend his statement because when we talk about the benefit, benefit for who? Human or nature? It has to be nature. And lastly, let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of new reverence for life, the firm result to achieve sustainability, the quickening of the struggle for justice and peace, and the joyful celebration of life. And this is why I think today's webinar that ECA has organized in Paraguay is really very timely. And I'm very pleased to begin with very sound, pertinent words of wisdom from the son of soils of Latin America, the Pope Francis. To take his words into another format, environment comprises of physical, chemical, biological component, and it is the interaction of these components which is the environment. Therefore, we must protect all components of the environment, physical, chemical, but especially the biological, because biological is the life and is the environment with the aggregate of the surrounding things, conditions, or influences. So in this context, translating science into action, and I think this is where I'm very glad that the Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Engineer Bertoni is present with us today. I think the measurement and monitoring of soil, vegetation, water, and other natural resources by remote sensing and by adopting improved system of cultivation is very essential. And the innovations can be technological, organizational, processes, management, and of course the governance. And I would emphasize, because we have many policy makers and the ministers present, governance can also be innovation. Prudent management can also be innovation. And better organization can also be innovation. So innovation is not just science and technology. Innovation is many things. And this is together is what we can think of leading it to environmental sustainability. And that brings me to the definition of sustainability. A state in which demands placed on the environment can be met without reducing its capacity to allow all people to live well now, but also in the future. The future is more important. We must hand over the environment better to the next generation than what we received from our forefathers. And that's the concept of sustainability. In this regard, there are four important pillars, environmental, economic, social, institutional. And all of these are important. The human dimension social is critical. If the human dimensions are not addressed, economic sustainability alone, as, o, as Pope Francis said in his words, is not adequate. And sustainable development really means making people better off in an ethically sound way, ethic, moral, is very critical, is very, and that's what stewardship is. So environmental sustainability and political stability also go together. I do not need to name any particular country or nation, but political stability and environment quality go hand in hand. In fact, we have almost 70 million political refugees, political refugees because of the climate, because of the soil, because of the turmoil in socioeconomic and human factors. And that leads to chronic poverty, poor economic condition, perpetual hunger and desperateness. And it is the desperateness 
that is really more threatening to human security. In fact, it can be a weapon of mass destruction. Therefore, soil degradation, environmental pollution, climate change, leading to desperateness, is a threat to global peace and stability. A very important threat. Therefore, we must take care of natural resources. And Latin America is blessed, endowed, with the numerous Latin resources. Large land area, 34 countries, 23% of rainforest, which is almost 50% of the planet's agricultural land area, which is 38%, including pastures and cropland, precipitation, which is one third of the world, available fresh water, which is one third of the planet, biodiversity, five countries, our mega center of biodiversity and population, which is important component and important resource, especially if educated properly. The per capita CO2 emission is going up. That is something which we can offset by management of natural resources, which we are abundant in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the share of global emission right now is 10%. But agriculture is an important component. Therefore, reducing emission from agriculture in Latin America can be very important because of the large area and because of abundant resources, and uh, especially in relation to agriculture. Percent GDP, 4.7%. Annual growth rate, almost 3%. World leading export of soybean, corn, sugar, coffee. And in this regard, I must emphasize Paraguay, our host country today, thank you for hosting us, is an example of the great success story, which I think is enviable, something commendable. And I salute the policymakers, especially the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and the President of the University, Professor Vera for producing science students of very high caliber. Indeed, Paraguay, although a very small country, has a population of 7 million, but it is number in the world list in many production of the agricultural commodity. Sixth largest producer of soybean. Paraguay is the eighth largest exporter of corn. Is the world's largest exporter of organic sugar, is the owner of the third largest branch of fleet behind the US and China only, and the largest exporter of electrical energy in South America. And it is known for the second highest returns on investment in Latin American and 10th in the whole world. So even though it's a small country, it is exemplary in many respects, something that the rest of the world can learn from. The total GDP, of which 30 billion, 28% comes from agriculture. So agriculture is very important. And the heart of agriculture is the soil health. Without soil health, agriculture cannot flourish. The population engaged in agriculture, 45%. Therefore, agriculture is important to general well-being of the Paraguay population. And the dominant crops, including other crops, soybean, cotton, coffee, corn, rice, wheat, sugarcane, very important crop globally, regionally. And of course, the most important part already mentioned, both by the president of the university and the honorable minister, that Paraguay is indeed a food sufficient nation. In this world, this year, especially the UN Food Summit, I'd like to congratulate personally all the nations of Latin America, but particularly Paraguay, for being food sufficient. We need this food sufficiency for all nations of the world. And you have set a very good example. The total land area, about 40 million hectare, arable, about 9 million hectare, permanent crops small, but uh, the cropland expansion has happened dramatically. Obviously, 
as a result of the deforestation and conversion of natural to agricultural ecosystem. So somewhere in 2006, I'll come back to that later, the government passed a zero forest deforestation law, which was very effective. And I think it's that's again that's an that's example that's that can be very important. Organic farming in Paraguay, organic land, almost 18,000 hectare, number of organic farms, 3,500, is very important example, a step in the right direction. Success of soybean uh, area, in 1950, uh, 55,000 hectare, uh, and at present, soybean represents 10% of GDP, a revenue of $150 million. Commendable for a small country, an exemplary success story. And hopefully it can be repeated elsewhere. There are issues which need to be addressed, not only for Paraguay, but uh, throughout Latin America and Caribbean country. Antaric fermentation is a source of 58% of greenhouse gases. It can be addressed. Manure left in pastures contribute 23%, including N2O and CH4. Synthetic fertilizer. Uh, can their efficiency be improved through better soil management? And I think it's a good approach. And there are many other sources of greenhouse gas emission that we need to get a good inventory, credible inventory, sources and sinks, so that we can develop policy how to address them. Why do we need to address them? Because climate change and agriculture are being noticed in terms of their adverse impact throughout the Latin American region. The region faces an annual damage of the order of $100 billion by 2050, including the loss of net agricultural export from 30 to $52 billion from the region. Therefore, something needs to be done, planned right now. And this is very timely for a cooperation with ECA and other member states. And Ohio State is fortunate, pleased to be part of that cooperation to do something about climate change through natural solution, such as agriculture, such as soil, such as vegetation. Ecological changes could endanger up to 70% of Brazil's soybean and 45% of Mexico's corn. Therefore, time to take action is now, not wait for it. Wildlife decline because of the expansion of agriculture is something we cannot forget, especially this is the decade of the biodiversity. And we know that as we clear the land as we expand agriculture, biodiversity is definitely affected. Soil degradation is another component. 20% of the soils of Latin America and the Caribbean region are subject to erosion, uh, both water and wind and desertification, which is more in arid and semi-arid climate, uh, is problem including 28% of Ecuador and 62% uh, of Chile and many other countries which are dry land are affected by desertification, including salinization. I have seen salinity problem, especially in the southern part of uh, Argentina, uh, which is a serious issue throughout the arid and semi-arid region. Therefore, LISM, the living soil program that uh, Dr. Otero mentioned, that uh, we are implementing together, uh, can limit the emission of the greenhouse gases through enteric fermentation. Uh, but at the same time, we must reduce emission from fossil fuel. We must phase out fossil fuel and reduce emission of methane and nitrous oxide and black carbon. We must reduce the land use emission, which are critical to achieving zero net emission by 2050. In the Latin American region, we must remove CO2 from the atmosphere because we have a large land area, soil, vegetation, wetland, Pantanal, uh, which can be major sink for uh, greenhouse gases, especially uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, restoration of soil, the UN decade of restoration, which is now, we can certainly implement and restore degraded soil for mitigating climate change. 
At the same time, we must protect carbon in soils, forests, and wetlands, and plan to return some land back to nature. Some of the degraded marginal land, which is uh, marginal to agricultural production, perhaps can be and should be returned back to nature. That should be a goal. So license uh, making soil and agricultural carbon sink, uh, important part is to manage crops by translating known science into action. And this is where the policy makers, the administrators, the ministers, those who govern, their prudent governance becomes very critical. And both for harnessing adaptation and mitigation of climate change through better improved agriculture. We must make agriculture a solution. Agriculture is obviously excellent uh, in uh, Paraguay as well as throughout Latin American countries, but it has to be made a solution to climate change adaptation and mitigation. There is no option. Agriculture has to become not just a problem, but a solution. And this is where the translating science into action is very critical. Soils of these agriculture ecosystems can be a sink through judicious management and adopting science-based knowledge with the traditional knowledge combining together. Right now, carbon sequestration, humid tropics, including Amazon basin, 400 million hectare, it is nitrogen limited. It is water limited sometime. Ecosystem carbon stock can be improved by as much as 80 megagram metric ton per hectare over two centuries. 20% increase above ground and with nitrogen input. Nitrogen limiting, water limiting as well. Ecosystem carbon stock may increase by 63 megagram per hectare with no nitrogen input, 16% increase above the present 25 petagram increase in the Amazon and 139, 140. These statistics can be made a reality through adoption of sustainable land use and sustainable soil, crop, animal management systems. Soil carbon stock in South America to one meter depth at 160 gigaton, that's petagram, billion tons, and annual emission from fossil fuel about 0.25, which I hope can be phased out over time, and annual emission from land use more than that of fossil fuel, 0.34. And this emission can be reduced. We have the science to reduce this emission. In fact, we can uh, reduce considerably by improving the efficiency, and we can offset these by sequestration of carbon in soil and vegetation. And while doing so, I'm giving the, here an example from Argentina, where uh, Martin de Azorita and colleague found that in the Pampas, the wheat yield for the same management keeps on going up until about carbon stock in the root zone of 40 megagram of carbon per hectare, and then it stabilizes. So the productivity of many crops, including wheat, soybean, corn, cotton, peanuts, even plantation coffee, can be improved, and the use efficiency of fertilizers, irrigation water, and other energy-based input improved tremendously by increasing soil health, restoring soil health, through management of soil carbon stock to the optimum level. And this optimum is what we need to find out, but it is mostly 1.5 to 2% in about 20 to 25 centimeter depth in the soil. So the total sink capacity of soils of South America, about 8.5 petagram, the annual carbon offset can be 0.1 petagram to 0.25, depending on the adoption of the technology. We published this article along with my good friend, uh, Yuka Sa from Brazil several years back. And it really need to be updated, but certainly it gives a roadway, it gives a path, it gives the potential of what is achievable and how we can translate science into action. In addition to that, at least in the present, uh, this year, when the UN Food Summit is 
Lysum can also help in malnutrition, elimination of hidden hunger by making nutrition sensitive agriculture, by making produce which are more dense in vitamin, micronutrients, essential amino acids, and many other nutritional value of the food. Water quality can be improved, it's renewability, air quality. Uh, the one health concept, if the health of soil is improved, restored, that will automatically lead to improvement in health of plants, animals, people, ecosystems, and the planetary processes. So this one health concept, in fact, I'm on a couple of committees of the UN Food Summit, and I've been emphasizing this, and I hope Lysum will help us implement that, but the whole One Health concept begins with soil health, which is more important part, and of course, uh, commodification of carbon, so that the farmers can get another income stream by ecosystem services payment through uh, the improvement of soil health through carbon sequestration. And we should also think perhaps urban agriculture. Urbanization is an important part in Latin America, probably the most urbanized continent of the world, which will have urban population very soon, over the next 10, 20 years, as much as 90%. Therefore, urban agriculture, which is soil-less, aquaculture, aeroponic, hydroponic, sand culture, uh, under urban agriculture condition, which can be very important part uh, to improve the local food production system. So urban agriculture should be a very important part to achieving the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that President Vera already mentioned in her opening lecture. And of course, uh, on this also depends the political stability, specifically, the sustainable development goal that can be addressed through agriculture and soil management, number one, and poverty, number two, and hunger, number six, sustainable management of water, number eight, sustainable economic growth, number 11, climate change, number 13, this is number 13, not 11, and number 15, land degradation neutrality, many other. Number 17, justice and peace. There are many goals which can be achieved through improved agricultural practices. Agricultural practices which have a resilience, a resilience to anthropogenic and natural disturbances. Uh, maintain soil ecosystem health is very important practical option to improve soil resilience. And these agricultural practices must also be prone nature. They must support interconnectivity and holism to make them uh, holistic in relation to soil health, which is the basis. It's the heart of agriculture. Soil health is the heart of agriculture. And true agriculture is the heart of human well-being as well, from all aspects. Lysum can help make soil of the agricultural ecosystem a sink through adoption of known technology. Technology, we already know many of them we have to translate that into action. And that translated to action requires strong cooperation, strong support, strong guidance from the policymakers. And that is why I'm glad that Minister Bartoni is with us today to help us translate science into action. And soils of this agroecosystem can certainly uh, be very important. The part of waste I'd like to discuss, in nature, there is no waste. The term waste does not exist in nature. Why? Because in nature, everything is recycled. And soil is the basic component of a re recycling mechanism. In fact, the wheel of life that uh, Sir Albert Howard, I have mentioned that before in some of my talks, uh, uh, he mentioned the wheel of life is made up of two processes, growth and decay. In fact, the death feeds the life. Dead organism in soil eventually feed the life. And this is how soil has the divine powers to transform, to resurrect death into life. This is the only place that can happen. That means growth and decay 
are two sides of the same coin. And that's what's called wheel of life. And from this point of view, uh, the law of return, that means every waste should be actually returned back to the soil. The last day that substance we take from nature must be returned to the place from which it was taken. Why I'm mentioning is because agriculture in South America, Latin American country, and elsewhere, including in the US, in Canada, Australia, Europe, is right now very chemically dependent. And that dependence on chemical can be drastically reduced by recycling the waste. And therefore, composting, and I'm hoping that the University of Essentia president can help us also develop composting facility at the university, where all the waste, including from the dormitories, can be recycled and made into compost that can be put on land. And there are special pads for compost where uh, the water coming out of the composting material is recycled through wetlands, through ponds, so that the pollutants can be reabsorbed. Uh, therefore, this research of how uh, recycling compost material of all biodiverse material that agriculture and urban lands produces, uh, they can be made into an asset, into a resource to recycle the nutrients, build organic matter content, improve soil health, increase biodiversity. So composting should be given a very high priority, both in terms of research and teaching. That brings me to the goal of LISM between 2020 and 2030. And the reason 2030, because that is the agenda 2030 as well. So our license goal can coincide, limit the greenhouse gas emissions, phase out the fossil fuel, reduce land use emissions from removing CO2. Some of these things I'm repeating because this is the time to indicate them. But at the same time, I have added return some land back to nature. Save resources, land and water for nature so that the nature benefits. And for nature protection, from the point of view of the policy, uh, we have talked about stewardship. That's why I began with Pope Francis, uh, his wisdom and his words and his advice, uh, economic incentive, I'll talk briefly, and of course the legal approaches as well. Uh, zero deforestation law of Paraguay was an excellent example. I think we need to, zero deforestation does not mean complete elimination. It means if you are doing some deforestation in one area, we must have an equivalent afforestation somewhere else so that net deforestation is zero. And that uh, adopted in December 2014, is an excellent example of what can be done. Therefore, futuristic agricultural ecosystem under LISM should be pedagogically restorative, agronomically productive, environmentally regenerative. That's where regeneration agriculture comes in. Economically viable, socially must be, the social well-being is very critical. Of course, the health, one health concept, and drudgery of the farm operations, especially the small landholders who do a lot of manual operations, somewhere their drudgery of those operations should be minimized so that they have a healthy lifestyle. And that depends on soil quality, soil health, and soil functionality, which uh, has a multiple function, biodiversity, restorative, holistic, all those components of soil, water, and other natural resources that agriculture should take care of. Therefore, sustainable agriculture system must restore soil health. It must recycle nutrients. That's why I'm emphasizing compost, conserve and purify water, strengthen biodiversity, and produce nutrition-rich food. The focus is not just on producing more food. The focus is on producing nutrition-rich food food which is like a medicine, food must be nutrition rich. Therefore, 2.3 billion undernourished and malnourished people, especially malnourished, can improve their health through these aspects. The last thing I want to mention is farming carbon. 
growing carbon as a commodity that farmer can get income from. Uh, and carbon credit is one metric ton of CO2. And the societal value that I recommend to policymakers is 120 to $130 per ton of carbon, which means $35 per ton of CO2, which is one carbon credit which is about 25 euro per ton of CO2. Therefore, if a farmer sequesters half a ton of carbon, they must be rewarded $65. This is why I refer to Pope Francis, who said, trading carbon credit market-driven demand and supply may not be the best option. Ecosystem services payment based on the societal value is the real reward that farmers deserve. Therefore, our farm policies must be pro-farmers. They must be pro-nature. They must be pro-poor. And this is how we can achieve the Sustainable Development Goal. If a farmer sequester one-third of ton of carbon, we must pay them $43 per hectare. And lastly, I would like to indicate that soil health is like a pyramid. This pyramid has a base. And the base of the pyramid is the soil carbon stock and the soil quality, soil functionality. The four sides of the pyramid are food security and nutritional security. Remember nutrition sensitive agriculture, I was talking about. Climate change, adaptation mitigation. Agriculture must be a solution to climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Land quality restoration, land degradation neutrality. The UNCCD slogan, uh, restore land to make sure net land degradation is zero. And of course, the biodiversity. But what's important is that this pyramid can be stable only if the apex, where all the four sides meet, is cemented together, held together tightly. And this honorable minister, and other policymakers who are present today requires policy intervention, policies that are pro-nature, policies that are pro-farmers, policies that are pro-agriculture. And this is where we look up to you to help us guide that policy. And at the end, I salute you. Thank you for opening the meeting and thank you for helping us in translating science into action in translating words into deeds. And we need your support. We need the support of all policymakers throughout the LAC region, throughout the world, to help us translate our science into action so that we can make agriculture of Paraguay and Latin America and the rest of the world a solution to climate, food, environment, and help achieve the Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you for the honor and privilege to talk to you. I'll be very glad to answer any question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ratanlal. Many thanks. Okay, pleasure to have this video conference. Uh, so now we're moving into the Q&A session. I would like to thank uh, or ask all of you who have uh, the option to turn on your turn on your cameras, please turn them on. We have a coordinator of the agricultural science and soils. Together with ICA, we'll be coordinating the questions. So, Dr. Lissam. Leguizamo, please go ahead. Good morning to national authorities, authorities from the UNA and ICA. Good morning, Dr. Ratanlal. Good morning, participants to this conference. Now we're going to be open the Q&A session. We received questions via YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom. And you can continue asking your questions and participating in this wonderful conference. We are going to analyze some of the questions that have arrived. A specific question, Dr. Lau, by Walter Sandoval, professor of UNA. 
what is your opinion with regards to the use of microorganisms to improve crop productivity and at the same time reduce the nutrients, phosphorus, and potassium input? Taking into consideration that Paraguay signed the Paris Accord and knowing that the idea is to reduce the greenhouse effect gases and agriculture is part of this process. So do you believe it is possible to increase our productivity at the same time or as we reduce our carbon footprint in large scale by using microbial technology? What is your opinion with regard to the microbiome of soil? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question, especially Paraguay has uh, almost 20,000 hectares under organic farming and organic sugar exporting from Paraguay, the largest in the world. So that's a very relevant question. Yes, microorganisms are very important for many reasons. One, microbial processes improve soil structure. They recycle biomass back to plant nutrients. Therefore, they improve production from that point of view. But also microbes create a disease-suppressive soils. Disease suppression is a property of high biodiversity. That means a healthy soil. In fact, uh, a compost, which I talked about, if a very mature compost is applied, uh, that impart disease suppressive nature because of uh, some predators, uh, some organism that suppress pathogens and pests. So yes, uh, high microbial activity in soil is very critical. Uh, typical example are biological nitrogen fixation, both uh, by rhizobium as well as by grasses, which is a different mechanism. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, they are very important to soil structure. So, but I also believe that perhaps uh, for larger areas uh, where biomass may not be adequately available, uh, you need about 10 ton, maybe five to 10 ton of manure per hectare per year compared with 100 kilogram of nitrogen. Uh, so much large amount may not be available everywhere. Their integrated management of combination of organic and inorganic, but proper management so that the inorganic materials are not leaked out into the environment is judicious use uh, is also very pertinent. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, Paraguay, Dr. Lal is... Paraguay, Dr. Lal is, is one of the largest beef producers. And... Uh, some groups say that producing beef meat would generate greater risks for climate change than the use of vehicles even, the vehicles we use to transport ourselves. What do you think about that? What might be your recommendation to find a balance point between this assessment and the production of beef? Thank you. And that's uh, obviously very important questions, not only for Paraguay, also for Brazil and elsewhere in the United States. So the same, same question has come very often. I very strongly believe that uh, prudent integration of crops with livestock and trees is essential to sustainability. Integration. And integration uh, is different than stall feeding of cattle. Uh, integration means uh, grazing, judicious grazing, judicious management. So uh, there are many regions where land use, the only land use that's possible, such as in dry land, rangeland, southwestern United States is one of the example. Uh, cattle is the only possibility. So cattle have been very important to uh, human well-being as well as to uh, environmental issues and nutritional security issue, but judicious management is critical. So I think there are ways and means by which the magnitude of enteric of methane emission from ruminants can be reduced. Uh, I had a student who uh, was looking at some of the mechanisms 
he actually puts different uh, organic material in the feedstuff to see whether enteric fermentation can be reduced. Yes, it can be managed. So with proper management, with judicious, I think livestock are very important to agriculture, but the question is judicious, prudent use. Uh, we can, manure management is another part. Cattle not only uh, emit methane through enteric fermentation, but manure. Again, we know how to manage uh, manure properly. I gave the example of composting. So we should have excellent composting facilities through the university, uh, through the research institution, through cooperation with the ECA, uh, so that uh, properly composted manure uh, can become then a sink for methane. When you apply compost to soil, mm -hmm. soil health is improved and it can oxidize methane. Uh, under good soil structure condition. So the question really is, um, is livestock important? Absolutely. Uh, do we need better management of livestock, grazing and feed of livestock to reduce emission of methane? Uh, yes, definitely. Should livestock material be recycled properly on the land through composting? Yes. So I think these are scientific issues and they should not be politicized. Go ahead, Dr. Leisamon. Go ahead, please. Dr. Leisamon. Dr. Leisamon, can you we, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay, perhaps you know uh, the minister or, or Miss Vera wants to make any question while we establish the the sound before. Si uno quiere hacer una pregunta, por favor, este adelante, ministro. Señor ministro, Mr. Minister. Or, Madam President, would you like to ask the questions while we wait for him to be get reconnected? Well, I have a question from the audience, if you allow me. Taking into consideration all your experience that you have in teaching and in scientific sciences and in, in, in what are your expectations in terms of what can be developed within the scientific associations that have to do with soil, looking at the climate change and the preservation of soil. Can we have a wider approach? What is What are soil scientific associations missing or societies missing? Uh, thank you. This is a very important question. Let's look at the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them. The word soil is not mentioned in any goal. Uh, word soil is mentioned in target, but not in any specific goal. So the awareness about the importance of soil uh, is not there as much as I would like to see. Today, this morning, before uh, coming to this meeting, I had a meeting with the UN Food Summit group. Uh, for a couple of hours we were discussing. And uh, there is a, a statement being prepared, 10 points for the Secretary General to make an announcement. And I emphasize that the word soil must appear at least one place. We cannot ignore it. How can you ignore soil? 95% of the food produced that we eat is grown on soil. 25% of all biodiversity is in soil. Soil is the largest reservoir of uh, terrestrial carbon stock. Soil is the largest reservoir of fresh water, what we call the green water supply. Soil is the largest medium to denature pollutants, to purify water. How can it be ever ignored? 
it is ignored because of lack of awareness. And this is where I think uh, there are two options there, or three, in fact. I would like to go first to the stewardship. Uh, that is why I began today with a citation from Pope Francis. I really salute him. We need religious leaders like him who are very uh, aware, who are very knowledgeable, who are very direct in saying what needs to be done. We also need uh, education, the curricula, the classes, the university. I think right from the primary to um, middle school to secondary school and the university level, soil environmental should be important part of the curricula. And then we need policymaker to help us translate science into action. Science does not end simply by publishing an article in a high impact journal. It's important, but it must be translated into action. And that translated into action requires good policy. It requires political willpower. That is why dialogue between scientists and policymakers is very critical. So my expectation is that there should be more awareness about the importance of soil. And I think we are making progress. I'm very optimist. In 2015, uh, the climate summit in Paris had Mr. Stéphane Lafolle, who was Minister of Agriculture of France at that time. Uh, he declared of quatre per mil, four per thousand. In, uh, 20, uh, in 2016, meeting in Marrakesh, uh, the minister uh, uh, of agriculture, uh, he also declared uh, AAA adapting African agriculture. They made agriculture an important part. Uh, last year, Minister of uh, Chile, Mr. Walker, and uh, Minister of Environment, uh, they both uh, gave very strong to soil and agriculture. So we are making progress, but uh, this uh, requires a lot more than uh, it is being done right now. It especially so for Latin America because uh, agriculture export. Uh, for all Latin American country is very large and it should be. Uh, right now, it's a food basket for the world. So agriculture can be very important solution. And for this awareness, awakening is very critical. That's my expectation. Adelante, Dr. Leguizamo, por favor. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Dr. Leguizamo. Thank you for being back. The students from Brazil, universities or Brazilian universities are asking questions to Dr. Lau. They want to know what would be the role of the university in promoting soil health? What quality or health soil indicators should be implemented so that they can be conveyed to farmers? And there's a comment. Maybe the main problem is to make farmers understand the importance of carbon sequestration. I would like to thank you. know what you think about this. <laughs> thank you. I, I, university can play a very, very important role. In fact, uh, I am very proud to be a teacher at uh, the university. And uh, I was very carefully listening when President Zuli Vera was talking about 55,000 students, I think. Uh, I'm, I was very pleased to hear that number for such a small country. Ohio State has 65,000 students. Uh, that student uh, uh, population. But we want to attract the brightest and the best to agriculture and to soil. The question is how? And I think that we always uh, lose to uh, parents sending their children to study MBA and medical and engineering and uh, many other uh, physics and chemistry, climatology, whatever, but not necessarily soil and agriculture and environment. Why? The salary structure is not as good as it is in the other. That means society does not respect graduate in agriculture as much as in MBA. So universities can change that. I think the policymaker can change that, the society can change that. In terms of soil health, yes, farmers should be very important. Yes, we must talk to them about soil health. There should be soil health competition amongst farmers. 
there's a competition among farmers on corn yield or soybean yield or on large pumpkin in the United States. Why not on soil health competition? Just that the farmers are recognized for, uh, and then the indicator, you ask a very good question. Our indicators that we choose from research should be such that farmers can relate to, understand, and we can quantify. So soil organic matter content, farmer can see the color of the soil and we can quantify how much organic carbon is. Available water holding capacity, farmer can see when a soil is moist, longer than it gets drier. So there are certain indicators that we can quantify scientifically, but farmers can understand. And that dialogue between scientists and farmers is very critical to promote this. And universities can play a very, very crucial role in this. Muchas gracias, Dr. Lal. Eh, en Thank you very much, Dr. Lal. With regards to the Global Alliance for Soil, this is an alliance that was created some time in history. What is your perception in terms of the perceptions of this alliance? Have you seen some concrete results or outcomes from this initiative? Do you have any suggestions for a better performance out of this alliance? I know about the alliance and uh, I am not too familiar with, I have not participated in many of their activities. So. I have not been um, very informed on this, but any alliance that works to promote soil health and promote uh, restoration of soil and promote the importance soil to many ecosystem services. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many goods that soil produces. Uh, there are many services, uh, food, feed, fiber, um, the minerals, the clean water, many other uh, climate change mitigation. I think if these alliances promote that, that's a very good idea. I was president of the International Union of Soil Sciences, and um, it has about 50, 60,000 members. And we just published a article. I'm the lead author of that article. And the article will be coming out in Geoderma. And it is written by about 25 scientists from around the world. And we try to indicate how soil can still put the sustainable development goal on the track. And I really believe that um, uh, alliances such as uh, the global alliance that you mentioned uh, of soil uh, can play a critical role in making awareness that if you ignore soil and agriculture, you will never achieve the sustainable development goals. And that's a fact. We still have time. We still have nine years. We can do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Lal. Another contribution here. Scientists, decision makers, and others need to be able to talk to producers, to students, to professionals. In this sense, what is the contribution of the press? How can the press generate awareness in terms of the health of soil, that this is a key source uh, or resource for our life? Are there any actions that you may know of, successful examples in terms of what communication means to Press can play a very important role. In fact, uh, I cannot overemphasize the importance of media. This morning, uh, when we were talking at the UN Food Summit, somebody brought about an article about soils, and I recommend you also look it up. The Guardian published an article yesterday on soil. Uh, it's a very good one. I read it this morning. In fact, uh, I made some uh, PowerPoints after reading that article while I was doing that, uh, which I'll use them in my class this afternoon. A um, few years back, I think four or five years ago, on a World Soil Day, which is 5th of December, 
Uh, and not many people know that there is a World Soil Day and it's celebrated on 5th of December. That is when the uh, Living Soil Initiative was launched also. Um, there was an article in Washington Post and um, David Montgomery, who is a colleague who wrote a book, uh, The Dirt, and also um, uh, quite a few other books he has written. And I was the interviewed, and that interview was published in uh, Washington Post. And a uh, few days after, a primary school teacher sent me letters from several of our students, more than 20, that they really like the idea that soils are so important. So here was a small article that got the attention of primary school student and their handwritten letters I have kept and I reply to each one of them separately. I think media can play a very positive role in promoting uh, the awareness about the significance of soil and also indicating that if the soils are ignored, the world peace cannot be realized. In fact, I believe, and I mentioned in my talk, uh, bigger threat than the nuclear weapons of mass destruction is the degradation of soil. When soils are degraded and the people who stay on it cannot afford living, it is they who migrate from their home and create problems everywhere. And they are migrating because the land that supports them was neglected, ignored. I mentioned 70 million refugees a year. So awareness, the basic cause of political instability throughout the world has been the scarcity of natural resources, often due to degradation. And the we now know, uh, looking at the uh, cores from, uh, from uh, lakes, that the Mayan civilization uh, had a problem with uh, soil erosion and degradation. We know for sure, I have picture of the Indus Valley civilization, cropland buried under sand dunes because of the misuse. I think our current civilization should not ignore this reality. And uh, media has a great role to play. I can never praise you enough for the good work. Gracias, doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor. Regarding family farming, which is so important for the country and really occupies and, and employs so many families who produce food uh, within Paraguayan agriculture. So in that sense, and in the face of climate change, and in the face of these changes that are occurring at a global level, the policies of the Ministry of Agriculture of our countries, could they, or uh, where should they, what should they target? What should be the fundamental premises to develop and face these problems vis-a-vis -vis policies? Thank you for asking that uh, very good question. It's very important to me personally. I grew up on a very small farm myself and I know how important family farms are. There are still 1 billion farms which are small landholders globally. Um, and they are resource poor. They cultivate uh, some of them two to five hectare. And the limiting resource is the major issue. They do not have enough resource to invest in the land restoration in soil quality. Because they do not have enough resources, they are desperate, they take out everything from the land. I remember very well, I was visiting Simit uh, near El Batan, in the city of Mexico, and they took me to see a farm, and the farmer was harvesting corn residue and putting it on a cart or to be driven by donkey. And I asked the farmer, please, why are you taking it away, the residue? leave it on the land. He said, why? I said, because next year, your soil will be better quality. Uh, your water resources will be improved. Your production will be better. He said, yeah, but I need money now for my children. And next year, this land is not mine. So 
So resource scarcity, desperateness makes farmer do the practices which are not conducive to soil health. Therefore, our policies must be pro-farmer, pro-resource poor farmer, pro all farmer, but especially resource poor. So one example was, uh, uh, I mentioned how much farmer should be paid. And I said $120 per ton of carbon and half a ton, $60 per hectare. I think that's a fair price. If anything, it's a, uh, but the market price may be only $2 a ton. And this is why I liked what Pope Francis had to say, do not go after market price, go after the societal. What are the societal contribution of soil? And uh, in the, going back to the US, uh, previous government, Obama government had $50 a ton of CO2 for geologic sequestration. And the current government has promoted again $50 per ton of CO2 for geologic sequestration. Why not $50 per ton of CO2 for carbon sequestration in soil? Why is soil and farmer second class citizen? I think this is the important policy issue. Why should policymakers make a distinction between engineering technology and agricultural technology? And once that difference is alleviated, the resource poor farmer will be removed from poverty. They will be empowered. So we have to treat farmer fairly, justly, transparently, give them the respect they deserve. That should be our policy. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the time assigned for this event. We would like to really thank you for answering all these questions, for sharing your experience. We will now give the floor to Dr. Gabriel Rodriguez. Please have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Leis Amon. Dr. Lal, this has been such an honor. We are so deeply grateful for your presentation and for such a clear way of describing your presentation and also answering the questions. Many questions were left unanswered, unfortunately, but we are trying to stay within our time slot. So we will send you the questions. The interest that uh, has been shown is really, really important and not only do we want to thank you for, you for your participation, but also the authorities, the minister, the vice minister of industry and uh, trade, the deans and the presidents of the universities with which we are connected uh, from Argentina, from Brazil, from Chile and from Uruguay. On the other hand, I would like to point out that during this session, we have had people connecting from the US, from Colombia, from Japan, from Korea, and also from Canada. So with this, uh, I would like to officially close this video conference, but not before thanking you, Professor Lyle. It was really, really an honor and extremely important to have your participation today within the context of this partnership with ICA, which is so, so relevant. We officially close this video conference. Once again, we thank the participation of everyone who joined. Of course, the minister, the uh, president of the University of Asuncion, and of course, our director general of ICA. Thank you very much. Good afternoon for everyone. Thank you. And as the president of the university said, this is only the first step of many actions that we will be developing together with UNA. Thank you very much. Bye.